with meticulous detail, Jesus predicted the destruction of Jerusalem, an event that took place almost four decades after His ascension. Not only does this prophecy verify His deity, it adds another very powerful piece of evidence to the case for the inspiration of the Bible. On one occasion, His disciples talked about the amazing architecture of the buildings of the temple. Jesus responded with a startling pronouncement. He said, Do you not see these things? Assuredly, I say to you, not one stone shall be left here upon another that shall not be thrown down. Well, surely Jesus' prediction would have shocked even His most faithful disciples. First, in the minds of the first century Jews, the Messiah was supposed to establish a new kingdom based in the capital city of Jerusalem. And second, the destruction of Jerusalem seemed virtually impossible because of its excellent military defensive position with high elevation and massive walls. So naturally, the disciples wanted more information. They said, tell us when will these things be? And in answer to their question, Jesus began to foretell events that would precede the destruction of Jerusalem. First, Jesus stated, For false Christ and false prophets will arise and show great signs and wonders, so as to deceive, if possible, even the elect. See, I have told you beforehand. When we scour the pages of history between the years of A.D. 30 and A.D. 70, we find a host of of impostors that verified Jesus' prophecy, including Thutis, Simon, an Egyptian who claimed to be the Son of God, Dostheus, and many others. Second, Jesus predicted that there would be wars and rumors of wars, and that nation would rise against nation, and kingdom against kingdom. The Roman historian Tacitus wrote of the months leading up to A.D. 70 when he stated, I am entering on the history of a period rich in disasters, frightful in its wars, torn by civil strife, and even in peace full of horrors. Four emperors perished by the sword. There were three civil wars. There were more with foreign enemies. There were often wars that had both characters at once. Third, Jesus foretold that there would be famines, pestilences, and earthquakes in various places. History couldn't be more abundantly clear that Jesus knew exactly what He was talking about. When recording the events from the year A.D. 51, Tacitus wrote, This year witnessed many prodigies. Houses were flattened by repeated earthquakes. Further portents were seen in shortages of corn resulting in famine. In this year, war broke out between Armenians and Iberians and seriously disturbed relations between Rome and Parthia. Fourth, Jesus predicted that His followers would be persecuted. The fulfillment of Jesus' prophecy on this point is so well documented, it hardly even needs verification. Among other testimony, the Roman historian Suetonius wrote that during the reign of Nero, Punishments were also inflicted on the Christians, a sect professing a new and mischievous religious belief. And Tacitus added that Nero inflicted the most exquisite tortures on a class hated for their abominations called Christians. Fifth, Jesus warned His followers, But when you see Jerusalem surrounded by armies, then know that its desolation is near. Then let those in Judea flee to the mountains." Josephus, the Jewish historian, explained that the Roman general Cestius brought a massive Roman army to surround Jerusalem. But he didn't press his advantage. In fact, not only did he refuse to take the walls, he withdrew his entire army. The reader can almost hear Josephus' amazement as he wrote, It then happened that Cestius recalled his soldiers from the place, Without having received any disgrace, he retired from the city without any reason in the world. From a military standpoint, Cestius' behavior was inexplicable. Now, it's important to remember that Josephus wasn't a Christian. He seems to be totally unaware of Jesus' predictions and certainly never considered Cestius' actions to be a fulfillment of Jesus' prophecy. Then we see that Cestius' retreat provided the perfect opportunity for Christians to flee the city, as Jesus had instructed them. History records that they did precisely that. 
Church historian Eusebius wrote, And when those that believed in Christ had come there from Jerusalem, then, as if the royal city of the Jews and the whole land of Judea were entirely destitute of holy men, the judgment of God at length overtook those who committed such outrages against Christ and His apostles and totally destroyed that generation of impious men. Six, Jesus predicted that there would be days of vengeance and great distress in the land and wrath upon this people. Of the terrors that occurred in Jerusalem, Josephus wrote, Neither did any city ever suffer such miseries, and that it exceeded all the destructions that either men or God ever brought upon the world. Jesus' description of Great distress aptly expresses what horrors were experienced during the fall of Jerusalem. Seventh, Jesus predicted the destruction of the temple and the physical buildings surrounding it. Again, Josephus provides a first-hand account of the destruction of the temple by the Roman armies. He detailed how Titus tried to stop his soldiers from destroying the remainder of the buildings, but he was unsuccessful. And when we turn to the field of archaeology, we find complete fulfillment of Jesus' prediction. Archaeologist Harold Mayer wrote, We do not have any remains of the Herodian temple itself because of the devastating Roman destruction in A.D. 70. H.T. Frank noted, Strictly speaking, the temple proper is not a matter of archaeological consideration since only one stone from it and parts of another can be positively identified. Jesus' prediction of the fall of Jerusalem stands as one of the most amazingly accurate prophecies in all of history. And it adds another piece of evidence to confirm that Jesus is the Son of God.